Okay, welcome everybody. Welcome to NOAA Live. My name is Nicole Bartlett. I'm going to be moderating today's webinar. This series is sponsored by NOAA's Regional Collaboration Network, where I work, which is spread across the country and helps connect people to all that NOAA does. Our amazing partner is Woods Hole Sea Grant, which is located at the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution. To find out about future webinars, you can look under the education tab on their webpage or simply follow them or like them on Facebook. This is the fourth webinar in a series designed to help you get to know NOAA and some of our incredible experts during these weeks of school closures. All of our speakers work for some part of NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. So if you hear people say NOAA throughout this webinar, you'll know what that stands for. Today, I'm going to introduce you to Catalina Martinez. She's going to talk to you about her job and how and why NOAA explores the deep ocean. A few guidelines, you're all muted because we have a lot of people on the line and wanna make sure that everyone can hear our speaker. However, there is a box where you can write questions. So go ahead and locate that now. We encourage you to ask them as we go and I will be keeping track for Catalina. She's gonna stop every now and then and answer a few. Depending on your device, how you access the question box may be different. For some of you, it might be a question mark on the bottom or side of your screen and others might have a little box on the side of the screen with an arrow and a hand. You click on the arrow to show the question box. All right, I think that that is enough of introduction for now. Catalina, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Sure. Hi, everyone. I am going to talk to you a bit about my career journey. Um, and my background, because I think we can learn a lot from each other when we do that. And then I'm going to tell you the amazing job that I have with NOAA and, um, and talk you through some of the technology that we use to explore the deep ocean, um, the conditions in the deep ocean, and we're going to do a few fun activities together. So first, um, I grew up in a Cuban family in a really diverse community in Providence, Rhode Island. My family was in the horse racing business, as you can see from these photos, um, which is a unique way to live. And we settled in Rhode Island. We moved around quite a bit when I was a kid because the racetracks would open and close at, in different parts of the Northeast based on the season. And we settled in Rhode Island because there were two horse tracks in Rhode Island at that time. And although we lived in the ocean state, Rhode Island is you know, completely coastline, such a special place. I had very little exposure to the ocean as a child. So I'm not exactly sure what sparked my interest in ocean sciences. I can only say that somehow growing up in that cement world of that urban area in Providence, I was still always fascinated by nature and by any and all water bodies, even puddles. I wanted to know what creatures lived in them and what the bottom looked like. So maybe my career path was inevitable. But as soon as I was able, I started to explore the coastline in Rhode Island and neighboring Massachusetts, and I learned to scuba dive. And I've been in love with the ocean ever since. And it took me a really long time to get to college because I had to work full time early in life and I didn't finish high school. But once I started down that path and finally entered college at the University of Rhode Island, I continued my education until I felt satisfied and I studied ocean science and policy. Now, do you think it was a giant leap for me to go from dropping out of high school to studying ocean science? Yeah, it really was. But I worked hard, I persevered, I made good choices, and I got a lot of really good guidance that started me down the path to an exciting career with NOAA. And I also made sure to always bring it full circle and provide access and opportunity to the ocean for students and children from challenging circumstances like my own. So they could broaden their view of who they can become and where they belong in life. And I continue to do that. Now, oops, I'm gonna mute that. Once I started to learn about ocean science, I learned about this incredible federal agency called NOAA, and I became determined to find a way to work for them. And I just thought NOAA does it all, right? From monitoring our environment and climate 
conservation of the oceans, management and regulation of our resources, to weather prediction and fisheries, to mapping and exploring the world ocean, I knew I had to find a way to work for this incredible agency. So thanks to Sea Grant, you know, this is almost 20 years ago now, to get my foot in the door, I applied for a fellowship that still exists today. This fellowship is special. It's called the John A. Knauss Marine Policy Fellowship. It's been around since the 1970s. And for those of you with, with children and students who are graduate students right now, I would encourage you to think about this because it's a really special program. And it allowed me to go to Washington, D.C., and I started my career with NOAA. These opportunities, these fellowships and scholarships and internships, they're gateways to professional networks and bridges to opportunities like no other. And I believe that this one, the deadline is in February, so keep your eye out for those students. Now, my placement with that fellowship was, it was with a brand new, exciting program in 2002 with NOAA's Office of Ocean Exploration and Research. This program has a special mandate to explore regions of the world's ocean we know little or nothing about, and to share this information with the public as quickly as possible. This was such a special, unique program within the federal government that I thought, maybe if I can join this program, I'd have a lot of different opportunities and really be able to carve out a unique niche within the program, and that's what I did. And they hired me out of graduate school, out of that fellowship, and I've been with the office ever since. So it's almost 20 years now. Now, we know the oceans are really important, but how much of the Earth's surface is covered by water? Why don't you all use your chat box and guess, is it 25% of the planet is covered in water? Is it 50%? Is it 75%? What do you think? All right, when Catalina. You look at this beautiful planet from space. What do you see? You see so, some landmass. You see a lot of blue. So, how much of that Earth is covered in water? How much is blue? Do you want to hear some responses? Can you hear me, Catalina? And Nicole, do you want to tell me when we're ready to move forward? Yeah, I, let me just connect with Catalina here. I think she's muted me. So Catalina, can you unmute your audio? Nicole, can you hear me? I can hear you. Can you hear me now? Sorry, I'm doing an audio test. Yes. You had muted your computer audio because of the video. Can you hear me now? Okay. Okay, great. So we have um, a lot, the majority of folks think that it is 75%. That is the clear favorite. We have very, very smart, smart people out there, smart students. Good. That's right. Three quarter of the Earth's surface is covered by water. It's, it's a special, special planet we have and we need to take care of it, right? So now, we know that 75% of our planet is covered in water, but how much of the world ocean has actually been explored? Do you think we know everything we need to know about the world's ocean? Is it 100%? Do you think we've explored maybe 50% of the world's ocean? Or maybe as little as 5%? What do you think? Okay, so the question for everybody out there is how much of the world ocean do you think we've explored? So a lot of people are coming in at four and 5%. Uh, five seems to be five to 10. There's a couple of 50% in there, but most people are saying very little. There's a few people who think maybe a quarter to half. Okay. Well, the real answer is maybe five to 10%. So we have a lot of really smart people out there and it's sad, right? But do you think it's easy to study the deep ocean? Do you think that's an easy thing for us to do? Now, when you look at the ocean, what do you see? When we're standing on the shores of a beach and we're looking out at the ocean, what do we really see? We see the surface of the water. We might see some really cool waves, but typically we can't see beneath the surface without some special technology, right? 
how do we get to see and explore and understand all the magic that's beneath the waves? Do you want, do you mean for your screen to be up right now, Catalina? Because we cannot see your um, slideshow. You cannot. Uh, you're not oh, sharing yes. it right now. Oh, I'm so sorry. That's all right. There you go. Um, we can see your computer, but not the slides. There you go. You're back. Thank you. Oh, I'm so sorry. Thank you for letting me know. Yeah, let me go back. Okay. So this was the photo I wanted to show you when we're looking out at the ocean, what do we actually see? We can't see what's beneath the surface, right? It takes really specialized equipment for us to do that, to get to experience the magic of the ocean. So it takes a lot of really expensive, specialized technology, as well as a highly skilled workforce in order to do ocean exploration. And that means a lot of money, right? And then we need big ships to gain access to remote regions of the world's ocean. And there's two ships that our office supports most regularly, but there are others as well. And out of Woods Hole, we, we support several ships there as well. But these two ships that you see on the screen, we have the NOAA ship Okeanos Explorer, that's the white one on the left. And we have the exploration vessel Nautilus, which is the ocean exploration trust vessel. And these two ships, have really specialized technology with a mandate to go to regions of the world's ocean we know little or nothing about and do ocean exploration. And so what I'm gonna to talk to you about now is some of the key technologies we use to do this work. And the Okeanos and Nautilus have very similar and in some cases the exact same technology. And we, we employ this technology in very similar ways to be strategic in how we do ocean exploration. So on the top left, you see a big robot. That's a remotely operated vehicle. And we're gonna talk more about that in depth. And beneath that, you see a really highly technical control room and that's on the ship. That's where all of the scientists and engineers and the operational personnel work during our cruises. And then you see a map. So mapping the world's ocean is really, really important. And that also takes really specialized technology. But when you're first gonna go to a region that you don't know anything about, what's the first thing you think you need? A map, right? Before you go into a forest or go on a hiking trail or going to the deep ocean, you wanna kind of have some idea of what's there. So the first thing you're gonna do is make a map. And the way we do that for the ocean is through sonar. So let's talk a little bit about sonar, right? We know that um, sonar is a tool that uses sound to measure distances. And we know that animals in the air and in the water, like bats and whales and dolphin, they echolocate using sonar, right? These sound waves and the sound reflections, like you see in this picture, they're used for them to, to navigate. And this process that the animals use was studied and it's now used to develop underwater sonar that ships and submarines use. And how sonar works is that a source, whether it's an animal or a submarine or a ship, sends out a sound wave. And this sound wave bounces off an object and it causes an echo. The echo returns to the source and the time it takes for that echo to return is recorded. Now, sound moves through air and water at different speeds. Now, for those of you who are out there, do you think sound travels faster through air or in water? Let me know what you think. These particles in air and water, they bump into each other and they vibrate because sound, when sound goes through them, because sound is a pressure wave. So imagine that these particles are in a race and they hold a little bit of information. And as that wave is coming through them, they're able to transfer that information to each other. Do you think that information is transferred faster in a liquid? or a gas like air. And Nicole, you can tell me when we're ready. Okay, um, we're getting a lot of folks that think air is the, um, is the correct answer. Um, a few people are <clears throat> guessing the opposite, but um, the majority are saying air. Okay, well, it's complicated and we don't really have time to, to work on this too much. 
But sound as a wave behaves differently in air as water. Water is denser than air, as you can see by these, you know, this cryptic little particles in the liquid box. So water has a lot more particles that are closely um, associated with each other. So actually, the sound wave can move a lot faster through a liquid, through water, than it can through air because the particles are farther apart, so they transfer their information slower. That's the most simplest way I could um, explain that. So really, the sound wave moves about five times faster in water than in air. And to make the, the maps of the ocean bottom, we use multi-beam sonar. So it measures the length of time it takes for sound to travel from a piece of equipment that's mounted on the bottom of the ship down to the ocean floor and back. And the time measurement is used to determine how deep the water is, and that's how we make maps. And what I'm going to do is show you a short video clip that will really demonstrate this better than I can. So stand by and bear with me. Although it's very surprising, Mars, Venus, and the Moon are better mapped than the Earth's ocean floor. We have huge gaps in details about the shape of the seafloor. And making ocean maps is a big part of the mission of the Okeanos Explorer. Since we can't see very far underwater, we use sound to measure and observe. The Okeanos Explorer has a state-of-the-art multi-beam sonar. Instead of making just one ping in the water like the old conventional sonars used to do, it makes hundreds of pings at a time. So not only are we mapping a larger area of the seafloor, we're actually getting a much more accurate measurement of the depth of the water. The word that we use to describe the shape of the seafloor is bathymetry. The maps that the Okeanos Explorer is making are incredibly exciting. They're not only giving us a new view of the surface of the Earth, they're making discoveries of volcanoes and other major mountains and canyon features on the bottom of the ocean. Okay, so I wanted to stop after we saw that little video and see if anyone has any questions before um, we're going to talk a little bit about um, some things you can do at home. So thanks, Catalina. We are uh, getting some questions in, and um, I wanted to let you know before we proceed with those that um, we have folks on the line from Seattle, Washington, and Louisiana, all across Cape Cod, of course, where, where we're based here. We have um, someone from Las Vegas, a few folks from Florida, and even uh, in and around Boston. So uh, I just wanted to let you know, these people are pretty smart about the ocean. Um, so one of the questions that we were asked is, why are some planets mapped better than our own? Diane would like to know. Well, it's difficult to make a map of the ocean floor. As you could see, um, we have to have big ships that are very expensive and they have to go to these regions and literally drive in a pattern. We call it mowing the lawn. They have to drive back and forth over enormous swaths of the ocean. And if, if you think about the size of our planet and that 75% of it is covered in water, imagine how many ships that would take to cover the entire world's ocean. So there's a huge effort to map at least our United States, you know, territorial waters um, at high resolution sometime, you know, soon, hopefully, maybe in the next, I don't know how many years it'll take with, with or how many ships it will take. I'm not a hydrographer, but um, that's the first uh, kind of systematic way that we're trying to get at least an enormous component of the world's ocean mapped at high resolution. What we do have is the satellite derived 
entire global ocean set of bathymetry of the ocean bottom. And it's not terrible. That's what we use um, in all the areas where we don't have a high resolution map. So um, for us to get a map of, say, the surface of the moon, they have technology that they use for that, and they don't have to go through water to do it. Um, going through water makes a difference. So it, it's a more complicated technology, and it takes a lot of effort. Great, thanks, Catalina. Um, Elise would like to know, how deep can you map using sonar? So you can, there are different types of sonars that are mounted on these ships. And some of them are for shallower water, um, relatively shallow water, and some of them are for deeper water. I believe ours, we have a deep water sonar on both the Okeanos and the Nautilus that I believe can go to about 7,000 meters at high resolution. Great, perfect, thank you. Um, Kristen would like to know, you had shown some of those bathymetry, uh, the mapping examples. What do the different colors mean in that uh, the depiction? The colors are, are different depths, and that's, that's a choice that's made by the person who is working up the data and making the maps. So I'll pull another image up so you can see that. Can you, can you see this? Uh, not yet. Can you share your screen? There it is. There we go. Yeah. So you see the bottom right? You have a, a guide that tells you in meters. So you can you get to see the peaks and the valleys. Um, and then the top right. You get to see, that's the screen that a hydrographer on the ship would see as the data was being acquired. So while the ship is mowing the lawn, you know, over an area, that's the way the data is visualized as it comes in by those specialized technicians on the ship. And then I don't know if you wanna um, move along. I have a little activity I can share with folks that they can do at home. That sounds good. So in the past, Long before sonar, we did have some very rudimentary maps that were not, you know, very good or at high resolution, but they had something to navigate with um, back even in the mid to late 1800s. So the way that they would do this is using something they call a lead line or sounding poles. Um, and what I'm going to do is show you a little activity that you can do. You can make your own kind of um, bathymetry profile at home using a simulated lead line. So hold on. And I <laughs> pulled this together yesterday to show you a little diorama. And you can do this in any number of ways at home. I made a little chart with an X and Y axis. Um, you can see here for uh, for my for my profile. So on the bottom, you see one, two, three, four, and that is just where I'm gonna be taking some data points. So that, and then here are just my measurements in depth. So you can use whatever you want. I used half an inch because that's what I had. I had a ruler available. And to make a little diorama of an ocean bottom, so I'm using some pieces of coral to make a little ocean mound. And then I made my own lead line. And so you just need a string and, a, and something that's weighted, you can tie onto it. And you make markings on your string, the same measurement that you use on your map, right, to make a graph. And zero is sea level. So the top of the water, that's sea level, right? So let's see, let's make one data point. So there's our one. And so I'm gonna grab my, my uh, lead line at sea level, and then I would measure it. And so, I know that it, that my data point would go here, and you don't have to put your, you can use graphing paper uh, like this to make your graph, or you could just use regular paper. I'm old, I have graphing paper. <laughs> and then data point two, you can grab your red line, put your little data point, and I know this is not beautifully done. Data point three, Grab your lead line at sea level. Just trying to give you a little ocean profile data point four. Grab your lead line at sea level and measure it. 
And what you can come up with is a little profile, a bathymetric profile on your graphing paper or however you do it, right? Now you can imagine if you were choosing your data points back in the day using the lead line and you know you missed this one mound in that area that you were measuring, how inaccurate you uh, your map would be because they you know when you're physically doing something that's that taxing, um, you're going to have huge gaps in your data that you're going to have to guess, do your best guess. It's called extrapolation. Um, and it doesn't it doesn't happen very well. So back in the day, it caused a lot of shipwrecks. They might have undersea mountains that the peaks would come up really high and rocks underwater that they couldn't see um, on their maps. So ships would hit them. So thankfully, we have much better um, much better uh, hydrography now, much better maps of the ocean bottom for us to navigate by. Um, and NOAA has an entire division that makes these charts and graphs for, um, for the world, really, out of the data that we collect and that all ships collect. Um, so we're very lucky to have these um, really good charts and graphs now. Do you have any questions about that? Um, we do have a couple. Um, let me, so one question, you had shown the paper your graph paper and yeah. um, so can you explain how you would do it on paper um, someone wants to know so you were you were saying you could use that graph paper to just indicate your measurements is that what you were you can do this in any way you choose right so what I have here is the x-axis is just my data points and the y-axis is your measurements. And I used a half inch, but you can use whatever you have available. So you can make a graph on paper. And instead of putting sticky you know, paper on your diorama, you can draw it out, right? Yeah, so, and so what your paper is just helpful because it gives you consistent measurements, but you don't need that. You can use a ruler. Right, so you would just create an x and y-axis on a piece of paper and That's specify right. your units of measurement on both axes and then as you took your measurements you would map them on the paper instead of putting it directly on the glass and the most important part is just to make sure that the measurements are equal between your lead line that you make mm -hmm. and your graphing paper or however you make that y-axis so just make sure the measurements are the same that way when you're counting so say this is this was my data point you're gonna count you know, your little ticks that you have on your string, you'll count the same number on your graph and that's your data point. So you can try it in a few different ways. Um, and this is all over the internet. This is a very simplified way of um, making a profile of the ocean bottom when you're at home and you can use whatever you have. Okay, so just uh, for everyone who's watching, just keep that in mind, making a profile of the ocean bottom and if you, uh, you can either watch, rewatch this, uh, the recorded version of this webinar to see Catalina explain it again, or you can try Googling that and see if you can get a different example. Um, someone wanted to know, I think it was Jane, where's the deepest place the Okeanos has gone? Hmm, I, we have vehicles that could go to 6,000 meters. There are parts of the world's ocean that are deeper than 6,000 meters. Um, but we once did a dive that deep a few years ago as a test. Um, so the deepest we've gone is close to 6,000 meters. I'm not sure if we got exactly to 6,000 meters, but it was close. I believe it was in, it was in a trench. I, I can't recall if we were in the Atlantic or the Pacific at that time. It might've been the Puerto Rico trench. Um, but I, I can't exactly recall, um, but we have gone as close to 6,000 meters as a test for our vehicles um, as we could once, I believe, so far. Okay, great. I think um, in the interest of time, we should move on just to make sure you get to finish. Do that. Okay. And I think just to clarify, when you're talking about dives, are you talking about, you're going to talk about the uh, the ROVs now, correct? 
I am. So you're going to see exactly what I meant. Okay, I'm perfect. sorry. Yeah. So the picture that you see on the screen now, these are those 6,000 meter enormous remotely operated vehicles I was just talking about. These two vehicles are called Deep Discoverer, the big one with the, with the white uh, foam pack. And the smaller one is called Sirios, and they work in tandem. And I'm going to show you a little video to show you how that happens. These are very specialized equipment that can go down, as I said, to 6,000 meters. They're connected by a fiber optic cable to each other and to the ship. And they have very specialized equipment on them, really high power for high powered lights, um, in high intensity lights. We have to bring basically sunlight to the bottom of the ocean to see natural color. Um, they have high definition video cameras and all kinds of other important sensors and systems. And I'm going to show you a little video of how they operate. So hold on just a minute. The lighting on the ROV is extremely bright. It burns at about the same color temperature as sunlight, 5600 Kelvin. That's the way we get the accuracy in the color of the images. We have a high definition camera which mounts on this pan and tilt right up here. On the front here we have hydraulic manipulators. These are seven function manipulators. They'll lift about 250 pounds each. The two-way transmission of all of our video and all of our data is done on two fibers smaller than one hair on your head. We have about six thrusters that make this vehicle go. And this will move just like a helicopter. It'll move back and forth, it'll rotate left and right, it'll go up and down, and it'll translate right and translate left. This piece and this piece are connected by what we call a tether. And that cable is 120 feet long, so we know we are never more than 120 feet away from the sled. The sled is connected to the ship by a cable that is approximately 8,000 meters long. That's just over five miles. The sled is used for several things. Because it's heavy, it acts as a depressor and decouples the heaving motion of the ship from the ROV. It has lighting to illuminate the area around the ROV, and it also has high-definition cameras to aid in the navigation of the systems. The sled and the ROV have to move together. It's just like a dance. So seeing that, I didn't know if folks had a question before we moved on. Okay, let's have a look here. Um, well, while we're waiting to, um, you know, respond to questions, um, we are on that topic. There were a couple of ones from earlier that we haven't gotten to yet. Um, let's see, everyone wants to know uh, what is your job? for what, how do you um, facilitate all this as part of your daily job for NOAA? So my job has changed considerably over the nearly 20 years that I've been with the program. So in the beginning, I helped carve out this entire program, this, this telepresence enabled um, exploration program. So I helped figure out, you know, how to staff the ships properly to do this kind of work what kind of tools and technology we bring together, bringing together lots of different partners to do that. Um, so I really facilitated a lot of um, really smart scientists and engineers to come together and make a lot of decisions about these things as we were carving out the program and how it would be employed by NOAA being a federal agency. So my job was to help um, bring people together and to, and to help carve this path forward for NOAA. Um, and I did that for quite some time. And over time, we would have research cruises where we would test out different technologies and test out the way that we would operate between ship and shore, which is something else we'll talk about in a few minutes. That's the next topic is this other type of technology. And we figured out how to do this work technically, but the hardest part was were the people, trying to make sure that we could have the people who were participating with us who were not on the ship to have a really meaningful um, experience with the exploration. So if you if you want, Nicole, I can hold that question until after we talk about telepresence 
because that will really kind of um, cement what I'm trying to explain here. And yeah. my job has shifted considerably, you know, in the years since we had to figure out how to do it, how to bring people together, what's the right technology, how do we employ it in a systematic way, which we're still going to talk about to, to explore the ocean. My job had shifted considerably. Now I, I, I used to go to sea two or three months a year doing this work. Now I work from shore. I help again, um, basically enable the groups to come together um, to do this with different partnerships. And a big part of my job is engagement. And I work a lot to um, share the excitement of all this work with groups that are underserved in, in different communities. And I think many of the other questions that are coming in are gonna be addressed by your next portion. So um, yeah, let's go back to the slides. and. Can you see my slides? We can. Great. So now that we've talked a little bit about some of the technology we use, what do you think it's like in the deep ocean? It's cold, it's dark. What else? You getting any answers, Nicole? There are all these weird and wonderful creatures that have to adapt to exist in all of these different depths and these different zones and extreme conditions. There's a lot of pressure at depth, right? If you try to pick up a gallon of water, is it really, really light like a feather? Or is it really heavy? Water is heavy, right? So the deeper you go, the greater the pressure. So our research equipment, our submarines, our remotely operated vehicles, they have to be designed specifically to handle these extreme conditions and especially the enormous pressure at depth. So the, the color that you saw on the top of that remotely operated vehicle, that big yellow foam pack or the white foam pack, they, there's two that I've shown you. It's made of a really special kind of foam. So if we wanna think about styrofoam is a really, really uh, special kind of foam as well that we know well, we use it quite a bit. Um, and the foam packs that are on the vehicles are made of a really special kind of foam called synt syntactic foam. So what you see here are a bunch of styrofoam pieces that we decorate when we're on ships and we're in research cruises and we color them with permanent marker. <clears throat> and then we send them down to the bottom of the ocean to, at different depths and we see how they compress. And styrofoam is, as I said, a specialized kind of foam. And basically it's really tightly compressed spheres of air made out of a special kind of polystyrene or plastic. And when you send the styrofoam down at depth, these bubbles are compressed Equally, basically, the pressure from the water is so great on all sides and in all directions that these polystyrene beads get compressed uniformly and these cups and these wig heads can shrink. And I'm going to show you some that I have right here and maintain their shape to some degree. So imagine that this wig head used to be the size of my head about. <laughs> And by sending it down at depth, and when we decorate these, um, this one went down to 2,000 meters in the Gulf of Alaska on the Alvin submersible out of Woods Hole when I did my dive uh, in the Alvin. And you can see that online if you ever wanna, you can look up my name in Alvin. And so this was done back in 2004. And these three cups that you see here all went down to about 3,800 meters. Um, depth on different vehicles over the years. And so this one went to the Titanic, if you can see that in 2004 when I was in, when I was on the Titanic, when I was on the Titanic cruise. So the syntactic foam that's on the vehicles has to be made really specially. Again, it's these compressed, tightly compressed balls of glass and they're tiny and they have to be able to withstand the different depths that they're rated for. And on our vehicles, on the Deep Discoverer, they have to be able to withstand 6,000 meters of pressure. That's a lot, right? Now, um, what makes our operation really special, as I mentioned a few minutes ago, is, okay, we have these really amazing remotely operated vehicles that we deploy. We make maps of the ocean bottom. We have all other kinds of sensors and systems so that we can 
try and determine where in the world's ocean we're going to find specific things that we're looking for. And we bring together incredible teams of very smart people to make these decisions and help us determine where to go and how to deploy these vehicles. What we're able to do now with the way technology has exploded using satellites and high bandwidth internet on shore is we're able to share all of this information and all of this data and even the video from the bottom of the ocean to people on shore within about three seconds. It's crazy, right? So we call this telepresence technology. And I'm gonna show you um, another small video clip that's going to talk about that. And the voice on this, some of you may recognize. So let me know if you know whose voice this is. So. Telepresence is a new paradigm enabling a new way of exploring the deep ocean. Telepresence allows people around the world to connect real time to what's happening on the ships of exploration like the Nautilus and the Okeanos Explorer. Telepresence works like this. The video and data collected by the ROVs goes up to the sled and from the sled it goes to the control room on the ship. Then all that information is sent via satellite connection to a ground station and then via fiber optic to the Inner Space Center at the University of Rhode Island. From the Inner Space Center, the information is distributed in real time to people all around the world through the internet. Scientists on call can have instant two-way communications with the crew aboard the ship participating in the mission remotely. The Inner Space Center is to ocean exploration what Houston is to outer space exploration, the nerve center for all of our operations. It's constantly connected to the ships and can operate 24 hours a day. Telepresence makes it possible for many more people, not just those on the ship, to be engaged in deep sea exploration as it happens. So we have one guest, Catalina. Who's the guest? So, well, Delaney wants to know if that was Dr. Ballard. It was. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> we went to, uh, no, maybe we didn't actually sail together, but we met way back in the day. Way back in the day, probably one of my first cruises for Noah. For those of, for people who don't know, can you say who Dr. Ballard is? Ah, yes. So Robert Ballard, he, if you've heard of the Titanic and somehow even very young children have heard of the Titanic, he is the scientist who first was able to find the Titanic with crazy technology, even back in the day when he was in the Navy and image it for the first time back in the 1980s using the Alvin submersible right there out of Woods Hole. Um, when he was a professor there at Woods Hole, a scientist for Woods Hole. And in 2004, I was one of the very, very, very lucky people on a ship called the Ron Brown out of NOAA, who went with Dr. Ballard's team back to the Titanic to image it again with his vehicles, his remotely operated vehicles, Hercules and Argus, Hercules and Argus. And so um, we were able to do a comparison with the imagery between the 1986 um, exploration in 2004 to see the degradation of the of the wreck in the, in the site. But he found the Titanic, but he also has found many other amazing things in the world's ocean. He is an explorer extraordinaire, including deep sea hydrothermal vents and just countless shipwrecks. He's he's the master of finding ancient shipwrecks. Um, so if you if you do some and he own his his ship is the Nautilus Ocean Exploration Trust is his organization and I've been very lucky to work with him and his team for almost the entirety of my time with NOAA. We all came together to figure out how to employ this technology. He was the first one to really figure out how to use telepresence to explore the world's ocean. He had this vision back in the 1980s to to do this work from shore to be able to expand the um, ability of ocean scientists to do this work remotely. And I, I was very lucky to be part of his team and a large team of people, including Delaney, um, who 
figured out how to do this. And we're so lucky to do it now. Um, but it was all because of his vision back in the day, really. Great, thank you. Yeah. So um, we, you have a few more slides or are you finished? Yeah, that? yeah. Okay. I just wanted to see if we wanted to stop for a minute. Yeah, um, go ahead and proceed because we're at 11.45 and I want to make sure we don't run out of time. We're probably we just going to go for another 10 minutes. Does that sound There's right? There's one more short video that I wanted to show just to bring all of this together. So um, now that we've learned about the technology um, and we've learned how we're able to operate between ship and shore, and what that does is it allows us to expand the opportunity of participating in discoveries in real time with anyone with an internet connection now, which is so exciting. And we'll share those websites with you um, before we leave today. And I believe we'll be able to leave them on the Sea Grant website. We all, this technology also allows us to engage scientists on shore. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna stop this for one minute. As you can see, We're, okay. um, th this telepresence technology has allowed us to expand our um, our capacity to do this work with scientists on shore. You can imagine if you're going to sea on an exploration cruise, how do you know what you're going to find? So how do you know how to build your science team? How do you know who you should bring with you? So say you go to sea and you think you're going to find undersea mountains, you bring geologists with you. What if you find um, a shipwreck? Maybe you didn't think to bring a marine archaeologist with you. Well, with this technology, you're able to um, contact that marine archaeologist on shore and have them get online and participate with you in real time. So it expands our ability to do our work in ways that we're only just beginning to realize. It expands our expertise between ship and shore. It builds out our workforce between ship and shore. So those few people who are lucky enough to be on the ship they um they can share the data and information with their partners on shore to help do the work each day to make decisions about how to operate and what to do and it allows um, us to have unlimited access to opportunities for any number of people so it has really expanded our ability to do this work um, and make the most efficient use of our resources these ships are extremely expensive the technology and the people are really expensive so this allows us to be really efficient and the careers that have that have grown out of this type of work are really special. Some of the most highly paid people we bring to see now are video production engineers and satellite technicians. I never would have thought that back in the day. So now it's not only those lucky few people on the ship that get to experience these discoveries in real time, it's anyone with an internet connection. And I'm gonna show you a video that will, that will demonstrate that. So here we go. Okay, so right now I'm just looking at you. Okay, there's the video. Got it. It takes a minute. Here at NOAA, researchers are exploring the deep sea to better understand our ocean and its fascinating marine life and unusual habitats. We're using unmanned vehicles similar to those NASA uses to search for alien life on other planets. In 2019, we traveled off the U.S. coast, and we found some amazing things. Let's take a look. Oh, oh my god! It's gosh. a feeding frenzy, oh my gosh. 80 miles off the coast of South Carolina, deep below the surface, there's a big fight going on for dinner. Scientists on a NOAA ship are watching this scene with robot cameras. What are they eating? A swordfish? Oh, the grouper's got a shark. What? Oh, what? Zoom out, zoom out, zoom out. Zoom out. Oh my god! <laughs> <laughs> yes, that has a whole shark in its mouth. Wow, that was intense. And what's amazing about this is that researchers around the world can follow the action on a live video feed to learn more about life in the ocean. For the north, in an underwater canyon of New England, we found another dinner scene. Take a look at this tug of war over a dead squid. Scavenging can be a way of life for creatures on the sea floor. They rely on dead animals that drift down from above. But the crab's like, no, you can't have my squid. These cutthroat eels are pretty hardcore when it comes to feeding. Would you say they're pretty cutthroat, Megan? I would. As you can see, on the sea floor, everything gets recycled. Nothing goes to waste. Go crab for keeping hold of your meal. 
that is life on the ocean floor. We're also finding important new habitats. These huge mounds of deep water coral extend all the way from Florida to the Carolinas, and they could be thousands of years old. We were lucky enough to explore two mound features that revealed extensive, healthy Luthelia coral reefs. Before this expedition, nobody knew they were even there. Scientists want to know if coral mounds are connected or if they grow in patches. This year, we found that corals in this area are much more extensive than anyone thought. Sometimes scientists get lucky. Last summer in the Gulf of Mexico, they saw something otherworldly. A glimpse of a giant squid that is rarely seen by humans. This footage was captured by a camera system that films the deep ocean without disturbing light-sensitive creatures. It uses red light, invisible to most deep-sea inhabitants, as well as a lure that looks just like a glowing jellyfish. This camera system is one of the many advanced tools used to explore the sea. Exploring underwater on this planet may be a lot like exploring an ocean on another planet. Engineers have to build machines that can survive extreme pressure and temperatures. And one day, ROVs like these could be diving in an ice-covered alien ocean. We're curious about how the ocean works and what lives in it. But people also rely on the ocean for food, energy, medicine, and for their livelihoods. We can't survive without the ocean. That's why we need to understand how it works and how it's changing. Look what scientists found off the coast of California in the Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary. Scavengers are feasting on a dead whale carcass that sank to the bottom. It's a good day to be an octopus. To see more amazing footage and follow our expeditions live, go to NOAA's Ocean Explorer website. Or visit Ocean Today for more videos like this one. Join us as we explore the ocean and the creatures that call it home. Very cool, Kat. Yeah, and so I just wanted to say that the, the hub for all of this technology, um, this telepresence technology, is at the Inner Space Center at the University of Rhode Island. And other than that last video, those first three technical videos were made by the team there, the production team. So big shout out to the Inner Space Center team. They're very talented. So our one of our biggest partnerships is there at the University of Rhode Island. Um, with the Interspace Center and with Dr. Ballard's group, the Ocean Exploration Trust and University of Rhode Island. And that's why I'm located there. I'm very, very lucky to be there to, to help enable all of this incredible technology to do the work that we all do. And so that is my presentation and I would love to take any other questions. Well, thank you, Catalina. Um, actually, um, we had a good, a good question just come in from Tessa that wanted to know, how many crew members and people are on one of those ships? That is such a good question, and it depends on the ship. So the larger vessels, I'd say, like the Okeanos, um, and I think the Nautilus has a few more berths than we do. Yeah, they do. Um, but say um, the larger research vessels that we tend to use, like the Okeanos, they can hold maybe about 48 to 50 people. And imagine most of that is crew. So how do you drive the ship? How do you keep that many people fed and with fresh water and um, you know, keep those engines running? So most of those people are crew. And then you have a certain number of births that are associated with science. And on the Okeanos, we don't have a lot of science births, maybe 15 to 17 science births. So then you have to figure out, how do I bring my whole technical team that's gonna keep all of this operating 24 hours a day because we work 24 hours a day on a ship. And then, you know, which scientists do we bring? Which do we leave on shore to use this technology and help us operate from shore? So each ship um, operates a little bit differently based in large part on the birthing. So our ship has limited birthing and very limited science birthing. So we employ uh, a telepresence technology expedition where only two of those births are taken up by scientists. The rest are technicians and running the ship. Um, and the rest of the science team is on shore and they can participate with us regardless of where they are geographically now. All it takes is an internet connection and we can give them access to really simplified tools and these high definition videos that allow them to participate as though they're on the ship. 
So we have um, a whole new way of operating that no longer limits, is no longer limited by the few berths that we have on the ship. So we're very fortunate that, that way. Um, and how long are the uh, trips typically? I'd say um, 10 days to two weeks is a typical cruise. And then you have a few days in port, you change out, you change out your science team, a few crew members and you go back out. So our ships will typically operate under 200 days a year around that um, is a good year, 180, 200 days a year. Um, I think the, the Nautilus may operate more than that depending on um, which cruises get funded. So funding is, is not easy to come by, right? These cruises are very expensive. The National Science Foundation um, is a big part of how these ships get funded. Um, there's a whole fleet of ships that are um, operated and funded through the National Science Foundation and other tools like the Alvin Submersible there at Woods Hole. And NOAA has a fleet of ships um, that are part of the oceanographic community. But the funding is, is very expensive. Um, and so people have to apply to get funding. And then these cruises, they tend to be planned a year in advance. That was actually uh, one question that Amanda wanted to know is how do you decide, how do you pick the spot where you're going to go and take the, the ship next? Um, so again, every group operates differently. The way that we operate with a, we operate with a community driven model is what it's called because typically a scientist before this telepresence um, opportunity came along would get a proposal. They'd submit it to a group like NOAA or the National Science Foundation. They'd get it funded and then they would get in line for ship time. And now that scientist can choose the people that that scientist brings to see for their team. They choose the objectives and where to go, how to deploy the tools, what tools to bring. They make all the decisions, right, with their team. So the way that we operate is instead of having one scientist who makes all those decisions, we have a community come together in a region. So if we know we're gonna be operating in the North Atlantic for a couple of years with the Okeanos, we will bring the, the community of ocean scientists and managers and educators together in that region through a series of workshops. And together, we all decide where are the most important areas to go in that massive water body um, to study what particular things that will give them the data and information they need to do their work, to manage the resources, to, you know, to understand what is actually there in order to manage it properly. So we come together as a community. And then, as I said, we bring two of those community members to see with us on the ship and they co-lead these community-driven expeditions with us um, to make sure that the objectives are being met properly. Thank you, Catalina. Uh, I think we, we need to wrap up, but I wanted to let everybody know that uh, there are two links on the webpage where about NOAA Live webinars that um, allow you to access additional resources. One is from Nautilus Live, which is Dr. Ballard's um, boat ship that Catalina mentioned. And then the other link is to the Inner Space Center. Um, you know, right now, all of our uh, expeditions are, uh, we don't have any boats out right now because of um, what's going on in the country. But if you check that website, you'll be able to find out when those resume. And you can also look at um, videos from previous expeditions, right, Catalina? Yeah, and also make sure we put the Ocean Explorer website up along with those two. Okay. And for the parents at home and the educators, there are tons of free downloadable resources on these websites. On the Ocean Explorer site, you can go to the educational resources link. On the Nautilus Live site, there's plenty of educational resources as well as the Inner Space Center. So there's a lot of um, educational resources associated with these expeditions. So they're very, very um, exciting. Uh, it's exciting content. And then on the Inner Space Center website, they also have a link to camps that they run in Rhode Island. And I, again, because of what's happening in the world, I don't know what's gonna happen this summer, but it's something to think about. They have camps for younger students as well as high school students. Um, and Nautilus has opportunities for high school students um, and all have opportunities for educators, artists, different groups. So there's different types of internships that you can get to from these websites as well. 
Um, so we'd love to have you participate with us um, once we can resume these expeditions. And uh, we look forward to um, talking with you next time. Thanks, Catalina. Uh, just so everybody knows, the link to OER, which is Catalina's office that she was just talking about, is in, is in the very title of the webinar. So you can click on that link right after Catalina's name. And that, that's the Ocean Explorer website that she was um, mentioning that you guys can take a look at. So Catalina, thank you so much for your time today. Thank you everybody for checking in. Uh, on Wednesday, our next webinar is going to be about lightning um, from one of our meteorologists at the National Weather Center, um, National Weather Service office in Norton, Mass. Glenn Field is gonna be talking about when thunder roars, go indoors. So be sure and sign up for that next one. And then the recording of this webinar should be available this time tomorrow. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, Catalina. Thank you. Bye, everybody.